tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Uh, it's completely unclear to me why they're searching physically tent by tent. Taking heat. Why thermal drone footage of the VPD's response to a shooting at a homeless camp is raising privacy concerns. Also, we came away disappointed. We have many very legitimate homeless people. No charges recommended against BC Mounties, who shot and killed a well known advocate for the homeless. And it's not, it's not good for me, good for everybody who have a pigeon in the North Van and everywhere, right? Pigeonholed. North Van District overturns its controversial ban on owning the birds. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. The actions of Vancouver police officers are raising questions tonight about the privacy rights of homeless people. Thermal drone footage shot by BPD and obtained by CBC News shows how officers responded to a shooting at Oppenheimer Park. Rafferty Baker has reaction from civil liberties advocates in this CBC News exclusive. This is the first time this type of operational footage from the Vancouver Police Sky Ranger drone has been seen by the public. CBC News obtained it through a Freedom of Information request. Officers seen as bright white figures moving through Oppenheimer Park's tent community. They check tents and enter some of them. It was part of a response to a shooting at the park that left one man injured. And we were searching for the victim and the suspect. We had no um, information on to where either was. The victim was found and a suspect was questioned and released. However, the investigation remains open. But the footage is ringing alarm bells for privacy advocates. Tents are basically these people's homes. The BC Civil Liberties Association says the courts only tolerate warrantless searches in an emergency. McDermott says police would need to have information leading to the search of each person's tent. It's completely unclear to me why they're going uh, searching physically tent by tent um, and not doing the same things to say any of the condos that are nearby. This policy allows us to use drones in exigent circumstances, whether it be in a tent or a house. And that's probably what people find uh, or might not understand is that if this situation happened in a, in a residential building, whether it be an apartment or a house, we would do the exact same thing um, because we are looking for victims or, or suspects. Byzantine says police use the technology in accordance with the department's drone policy, policy that the BCCLA helped create. But McDermott says she'd never seen actual footage showing how the Sky Ranger drone is used. I think it's just another example where we're seeing um, the rights of the, of the poor um, being less valuable than those of us who have our own um, housing. The tent community at Oppenheimer Park was broken up and cleared out in May. Another tent city started at Crab Park. And then when that was cleared out, Strathcona Park. Byzantine says if the same situation happened today, police would do the exact same thing. There was no infringement of anybody's privacy in this exigent circumstance. This was life or death, and we would do the same outside or inside. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, Vancouver. No charges are being recommended against RCMP officers who shot and killed a well-known homeless advocate. Police were responding to calls that the man, Barry Schantz, was suicidal and had barricaded himself inside with a shotgun. But as Tina Lugrin reports, Schantz's sister is now demanding policy changes when it comes to how police respond to calls. Help yourself. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much. Marilyn Farcourt traveled to BC from a small town in Ontario to meet and offer food to homeless people here in Abbotsford. I'm handing these out in memory of Barry Schantz. Her brother, Barry Schantz, was a well-known and outspoken advocate for homeless people. We have many very legitimate homeless people, nowhere to go. And in these parts, you know Barry? Yes, I knew Barry. everyone remembers him. Incredibly passionate. So passionate that I saw him burst into tears like a little child one day, just talking about the whole homeless situation. I mean, this is an emotional journey I'm on. It just helps me resolve the feelings in my life. Um, my brother was an advocate, and I kind of feel like Barry needs an advocate now. These constant arrests. Shantz was struggling with mental health and PTSD. And last January, while at his partner's home in Lytton, B.C., he became suicidal and had a gun. His partner called 911 saying he had never hurt anyone, but was clearly in crisis. 
After a six-hour standoff where he repeatedly asked police to shoot him and fired at them once, he was shot and killed. Today, BC's independent police watchdog found no criminal negligence on the part of the officers. They didn't try to push the issue in any way, and they used trained crisis negotiators who are trained to deal with these very issues. But they couldn't find a mental health professional in time to be there, something his sister says could have prevented his death. They had helicopters there bringing in officers and resources for that, but they didn't bring in a health professional. And... Um, that's a major component that they've overlooked. Do you remember Barry at all? She's filed a complaint with the RCMP asking them to review their policies to help those in crisis before it costs them their life. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Abbotsford. The man charged with the first-degree murder of Nanaimo teen Michaela Changs has pleaded not guilty in provincial court. Stephen Bacon faces a first-degree murder charge in that case. Chang was reported missing in March of 2017, but it wasn't until May of that year that her body was located in Nanaimo. Chang was a student at John Barsby Secondary School in Nanaimo. Her father, Carrie Chang, says the plea was expected. However, he's glad the case is progressing. Bacon was arrested last year in Fredericton, New Brunswick, on an unrelated matter. In the final days on the campaign trail, the B.C. Green Party is focusing on a forward-looking plan to get the province through the pandemic. Leader Sonia Furstenau was in West Vancouver today, where she says the entire Sea to Sky corridor could be a showpiece for a progressive economy. This is a region that is building its economy in step with its love of the outdoors. The Emerging Economy Task Force that we championed in government zeroed in on climate change as one of the major forces shaping our economy and it highlighted the opportunities that come from developing a low carbon economy. Across town Liberal leader Andrew Wilkinson was in Surrey and in Richmond. Wilkinson focusing on his promise to eliminate the PST for one year and also stepped up his attacks on the NDP. We're gonna have to have a plan to get out of this pandemic recession and the NDP don't have one at all. We do. We have a serious economic plan to get us through this and help us recover. And secondly, as we go into a pandemic, I like to think it'd be helpful to have a medical doctor in the Premier's office talking to Dr. Henry about the best way to do things as we move forward. And NDP leader John Horgan returned to the swing riding of Coquitlam Burke Mountain, where he talked with local seniors. Horgan says the coronavirus has made this a challenging time, but he argues he's the best leader to get the province through it. Tomorrow, the day after that, the month after that, it's uncertain for all of us. We're in a pandemic today. We will be next spring and most likely next fall and into next year. So we need to plan and make sure people are well, people are secure, and people are healthy. That's been our focus. That's what our platform's all about. Morgan says the NDP platform has better protections for everyone from workers to seniors in care. To BC's other health crisis now, and the BC Coroner Service says on average more than four people died every day last month as a result of the ongoing drug overdose crisis. That's according to its latest report on illicit drug deaths. It says there were 127 overdose deaths in September, down from 150 recorded in August. But it's an increase of 112 percent over last September when the number had dropped to 60. The coroner's service says the vast majority of people dying are men, many of them between the ages of 30 and 59. Through the first nine months of this year, 1,202 people have died from fatal overdoses, compared to a total of 983 for all of last year. NBC saw an unusually high percentage of positive COVID-19 tests today for the third time in four days. Health officials announcing 167 new cases in total. The CDC reporting a positivity rate of 2.7%. Since the start of October, that number had been hovering closer to 1% most often. There are now 1,688 active cases of COVID-19, and one more person has died for a total of 254. 69 people are in hospital tonight, 18 in intensive care, and there have been three new outbreaks at healthcare facilities 
while three others have been declared over. A frustration tonight for a Port Coquitlam craft brewery owner after an unusual investigation for police and two massive fermenting tanks stolen from an under construction business. Bill Sachs says special equipment would have been needed to move the one ton tanks for where they were being stored. The tanks are worth an estimated $20,000 each. Sachs says the loss is a devastating blow to his fledgling brewery. Coquitlam RCMP are investigating. And the CEO of TransLink is stepping down after five years on the job. And it's been a joy and a pleasure to be leading TransLink uh, through this period. But I, I also have my family uh, to be thinking about, as, as I think you know. Um, uh, my family lives on the other side of the border in the, in the Seattle region, as does my wife. So at, at, at some point, uh, family calls and, and time to go, go home. Esmond says he will leave the Transit Authority in February. He joined TransLink back in 2016 after more than a decade-long run working with transit organizations in Washington State. Esmond's time with TransLink saw more than $9 billion worth of approved transit expansion projects, the implementation of tap-to-pay and touchless fare gates, and quicker sea bus service and double-decker buses. Oh, yes, there it is, the sunset in behind Johanna Wagstaff tonight with her first check of the forecast. Yes, not a bad backdrop. I was worried about a few stray showers this evening, but they seem to be remaining well offshore. So what you see, I think, it's what you get for the next couple of hours. Uh, temperatures will be dropping in the long range forecast. Here's what they look like right now across the board. We're hitting seasonal marks over the past few days. Right now at 10 at YVR. We hit a 12 earlier today. Uh, temperatures, though, are coming down, but not dramatically, at least for our afternoon highs. I'll talk more about that later on. But I think our story the next few days is timing showers out and it's a tough job this week i've got to say here's a satellite and radar right now you can see some clearing in the satellite and those showers staying well off the coast of washington not ruling out a few stray, stray showers overnight but the risk is definitely diminishing looks like not a bad start to wednesday either i think we'll get another mix of sun and cloud day notice in the interior snow levels are coming down to about 800 meters so we will see some flakes fly in through the uh, higher levels of the okanagan and out towards the kootenays but a fairly nice start uh, for us here on the south coast. Chance of a shower Wednesday night into Thursday, but I am watching the timing of a Friday system very closely. The models, they're all over the place. I don't often put question marks in my forecast, but just wait till the five day and now uh, we'll see what I've got. <laughs> it's interesting. Questions, questions everywhere. All right, Joe, thanks. Talk to you in a bit. Well, should they so desire, the good people in the District of North Vancouver will once again be allowed to own pigeons. Council voting last night to overturn a controversial ban that sparked quite a flap and a year-long dispute. Our Justin McElroy has been on the bird beat, among other things, following the story from the very start. So, Justin, this has been a, a long time coming. Yeah, not just a flap, but Mike, lawsuits, an independent investigation. It all started 51 weeks ago when North Vancouver voted to ban pigeons, the only municipality in Metro Vancouver to have a law explicitly banning the birds. But what we found out after Freedom of Information documents were released to CBC News is that it came about after one councillor, Betty Forbes, emailed other councillors pressuring them to put in a ban. What she didn't announce publicly is that her next door neighbor owned pigeons. He was the only person in the district staff could find that owned pigeons, and she had been complaining about his birds for two years. Well, after CBC News announced all of this information, there became lawsuits, there was that independent investigation. At the end of the day, a majority of councillors decided that they wanted to reverse this ban. Forbes and Muria recused themselves from that conversation because of uh, their ongoing lawsuits, so it passed unanimously. So the only pigeon owner in the district, Kuo Wan Dulay, is pretty happy he'll get to keep his birds. It's not, it's not good for me, good for everybody who have a pigeon in North Man and everywhere, right? I fight, I fight, fight for everyone. Everybody loves a bird, right? For cat, dog. I say, when you have a neighborhood, I hope be nice to everybody in the neighborhood. 
but it won't all be nice in the neighborhood for a little while to come. That's because even though Dulé will be able to keep his patience, there's still that lawsuit of conflict of interest against Forbes and Lisa Muri, the counselor that brought forward the ban that will be going to BC Supreme Court next month. If found guilty, the punishment for Forbes and Miri is disqualification from office. All right, so not completely out of the cage just yet. Justin, thanks. Justin McElroy reporting tonight. And a reminder, you can also watch this newscast live on CBC Gem, the free app. CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Well, as the saying goes, good things come in threes. And with a provincial election and U.S. election this month, there are now rumblings of a Canadian federal election. We will explain why next. And thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream tonight. But well, a group of researchers in New Brunswick is working to slow the effects of climate change along that province's coastline. The CBC visited them before the pandemic began to see how it all works. Here we are in St. Marie Saint Raphael and we can see the erosion. And here we have several causes of the erosion. Uh, climate change, yes. Depending on the, the location, we talk about 80, 90 uh, meter you lose. Uh, on the website, we have uh, uh, an illustration showing uh, between uh, 1944 to the year of 2000, how much you lose on the coast. present time there we have impacts uh, related to the water relating to the wind what we can do it is to understand what are the impacts of the climate change on the coast and how we can slow the impacts how we can protect the coast right now we are on a new road but uh, up to uh, five six years ago the road was uh, way closer to the sea. Now there's no road. <laughs> Actually the sea uh, washed it out and uh, now it's just a beach. Well there's some concerns about, among the local residents in Chasson Fils that if the dunes breaks apart because of the erosion that it might uh, put their land in danger towards the erosion. Disaster. <laughs> A lot of land lost and uh, it's never coming back have more uh, strong storms, stronger storms uh, more often and that's the main reason we, we're losing all that sand. When we, we trapped a lot of sand in the cages and uh, we hope that the vegetation is going to come back. We stabilize the soil with the roof so it is a better solution but it will not stop the impact of the climate change. It will not stop the impact of the waves, etc. But it will help. There's a factor coming more public it's called echo anxiety. And uh, you can really feel in the population around here. On a personal level, I think we, we need to stop the water rising. Uh, they have to create a group of citizens working with us. So we talk about the risk, we talk about the scenarios, the solution, the possible solution, and the working group choose what they want to put forward, what they want to implement. And after that, we go uh, at the office to, to propose the adaptation plan uh, regarding all the feedbacks of the citizens. And also, I, I like the Canadian Peninsula. It's a very beautiful place. Well, just as we in British Columbia near the end of a provincial election, another one could soon be on the horizon, but this time a federal election. Tensions are flaring in Parliament, a bizarre standoff over a Conservative motion. The CBC's David Cochran has more on the parliamentary drama that could send you back to the polls.
We want Parliament to work. With For a Prime Minister who says he doesn't want an election, Justin Trudeau sounds a lot like a politician willing to have one. Now the opposition parties have a choice. Do they want to make Parliament work and work for Canadians, or do they want to vote non-confidence and trigger election? The choice, Mr. Speaker, is theirs. Mr. Speaker, Canadians have a trust problem with this Prime Minister. The issue is the Conservative demand for a special committee to resurrect the WE investigation and dig into other controversies involving Liberal insiders. Who and what are the Prime Minister covering up with these latest threats of an election? The Liberals want a committee to examine all pandemic spending, not just the controversies, and are making the disagreement a confidence vote. This Prime Minister has stated his willingness to plunge the nation into a pandemic election all over the procedural wrangling of a committee. Seriously. Apparently so. An election when travel restrictions would block leaders from campaigning in the Atlantic and the North. When the battleground ridings in Quebec and Ontario are COVID hotspots. The Bloc Québécois is backing the Conservatives, even if Trudeau's election threat is real. We do not fear such an opportunity because we are absolutely ready to go if need be. The NDP is trying to broker a compromise while condemning Trudeau's stance. That is outrageous and it is absurd. Let me be very clear. The only way there is an election right now is because the Prime Minister chooses to have one. Everyone insists they don't want an election and will keep talking, but right now this is headed to a confidence vote on Wednesday, one year to the day since the last election. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. And the Trudeau government is also being criticized tonight for how it's handling the lobster fishery dispute in Nova Scotia. As Kayla Hounsel reports, the fisheries minister says she is assigning a special representative for negotiations between Indigenous and commercial fishers. St. Mary's Bay was choppy today, but the situation off the water remained calm. Fishermen from the Sebeganegadi First Nation continue to tend their traps. And another band, the Member 2 First Nation in Cape Breton, now says it plans to launch its own moderate livelihood fishery within weeks. We're still having discussions with the federal government. We feel that they're taking us very seriously now. They heard it, heard it loud and clear, I think, across the country that this is a, a big issue. The Bodledek First Nation, also in Cape Breton, launched a self-regulated fishery nearly three weeks ago. There has been no outcry from commercial fishermen there. We're fighting two separate fights here. You know, we've got a different stance in our community, and um, I wish them well in their endeavors, and it's just, uh, I can't comment on theirs. In southwest Nova, commercial fishermen say they are worried about conserving lobster stocks because the Mi'kmaq are fishing out of season. Last week, two lobster pounds where Mi'kmaq fishers were storing their catch were targeted and vandalized. One was burned to the ground. Today, the owner of the other one pleaded guilty to not disclosing lobster sales to fisheries officers in the past and was ordered to pay $20,000. It comes at a time of great concern over who has the right to buy and sell lobster. Uh, we've taken this issue extremely seriously. It is important uh, that we keep Canadians protected and safe as we move forward to respect uh, and uphold uh, rights that have been long recognized. Uh, for Indigenous fishers. The fisheries minister says she is appointing a special representative to help negotiate. We're hoping that we progress a lot more with, before the end of the week. Um, we're kind of pushing our timelines very hard and we're hoping that uh, in the next couple of weeks we have something on paper and it's, it's out there for the world to see. Chief Sack says he is meeting with his fishermen tonight and has good news to share with them. He declined to share it with us. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Sonyaville, Nova Scotia. An Ottawa police constable has been acquitted of manslaughter and assault in the death of a 37-year-old Somali Canadian four years ago. The death exposed deep cracks in race relations in the capital. CBC's Judy Trin has more on the decision and what happens next. A mother's anguished cries as she's kept from helping her unconscious son. CCTV video shows two officers trying to arrest Abdurrahman Abdi. Constables Dave Weir and Daniel Monsion strike him with batons, kick him, and take him to the ground. Monsion punches him in the face wearing knuckle-plated reinforced gloves. 
In 2016, police were called to a coffee shop after a 911 call about Abdi assaulting women. In his ruling, Justice Robert Kelly says the Crown failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Monsion's punches resulted in the heart attack that killed Abdi. The judge found Monsion not guilty of manslaughter, not guilty of assault, and not guilty of assault with a weapon because the judge said it was reasonable force used to subdue the suspect. There was no brutal beating. Uh, I think we're going to see in the actual judgment that the, uh, it was on balance, uh, a blow to the pavers when he was taken down by Weir that caused that nose fracture. Abdi's death damaged race relations between Ottawa's police and its black community and led to protests of police brutality. After 70 days in court, this decision fell far short of what the victim's family wanted. They are uh, truly devastated by the decision. And uh, I have assured them that uh, this is far from the end of uh, our fight on behalf of the family. Abdi's family is suing Monsian and the Ottawa Police Service for $1.5 million. The constable also faces an internal investigation. After being suspended with pay for more than four years, Monsian says he plans to return to work. Judy Trin, CBC News, Ottawa. The U.S. Justice Department is suing Google. It alleges the online search giant is abusing its market dominance in ways that hurt competition and harm consumers. The company calls the antitrust lawsuit deeply flawed, but as Ellen Morrow reports, the landmark legal action comes as lawmakers eye the growing influence that big tech firms like Google wield. This is the largest anti-monopoly lawsuit against a tech company in decades. Google, according to the Department of Justice, has an illegal monopoly over online searches and search advertising, a monopoly that Google maintains, according to the lawsuit, through what the lawsuit describes as exclusionary agreements with device manufacturers. Take the iPhone, for example. Google pays Apple billions of dollars to be the default search engine on every single iPhone. The DOJ says that's stifling competition and it's anti-innovation. In a statement from Attorney General William Barr this morning, he said competition in this industry is vitally important, which is why today's challenge against Google, the gatekeeper of the internet, is a monumental case. This lawsuit strikes at the heart of Google's grip over the internet for millions of American consumers, advertisers, small businesses and entrepreneurs beholden to an unlawful monopolist. Google, for its part, calls the lawsuit flawed. It says there's no difference between what it does and a cereal brand paying a grocery store to stock its products at eye level. It says people use Google because they want to, not because they have to. This lawsuit is the product of an investigation that lasted more than a year. It comes just two weeks before the election and at a time when tech giants like Google, which owns YouTube, Facebook and Twitter, are all facing increasing scrutiny here at the Department of Justice and on Capitol Hill. Politicians from the left and the right who never seem to agree on anything at all, all agree that these companies that are a part of so many people's daily lives have too much power. The companies say that isn't true. In the lawsuit, the Department of Justice talks about structural relief. That could mean breaking up Google if this lawsuit is successful. But this would be, will be, a very lengthy legal battle, one that Google will fight with everything it has. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. Pleading for help, airline workers demand Ottawa provide aid for their battered sector. More on their concerns and the government response just ahead. Mr. Kosygin has worn many hats since he arrived in Canada, but last night, as his motorcade moved through the darkness of the city to the Coliseum, he was Alexei Kosygin, hockey fan. Premier Bennett of British Columbia tried to show him how to use the hockey stick as he chatted with the team captains Henri Richard of the Canadians and Orland Kurtenbach of the Canucks, but the Soviet leader didn't need any help. He still has his skates at home and sometimes uses them at 67. 
The home team was slaughtered six goals to nothing. He'd appeared to be rooting for the home team, but also appeared impressed by the standard of play of both teams. After the earlier demonstrations in Montreal and Ottawa, Mr. Kosygin's first hours in Vancouver were almost uneventful, and he seemed to be reacting to the better reception. He was beaming, and he's reported to have said it was the best reception he'd received outside his own country, which may have involved a little polite exaggeration. His daughter, incidentally, went shopping today with Prime Minister Trudeau's mother-in-law and bought some clothes. Later, on the ferryboat cruise, Mr. Kosygin saw three Soviet ships. Grain and fishing have made Vancouver an important port for the Soviet economy. But this trip is not about ports and buildings, but the political direction of Canada, and I talked to three journalists, a Briton, an American, a Russian, about that. I think I'm as puzzled as anybody else in this trip uh, what the Canadian government is aiming at in the long run. But you cut loose from us to a certain extent in the last few years, I don't think anybody disapproved of this in Britain, except perhaps for the far right, the old traditionalists. I don't think anybody else did. And I think anybody would regard it as completely understandable that you start cutting away a bit from the United States. I think this would be regarded as a healthy trend. And Canada is an enormous, potentially an enormous force in the world. And if it, if it exerts itself in foreign policy, this can only be good. Mr. Kosygin is helping you establish a uh, Canadian identity uh, 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 separate from its identity and association with the United States. And uh, I, I think that that will be, well, it will carry on for a long time because out of this will grow certain exchanges and, and uh, associations, trade and whatnot. Uh, in, in the long run, it'll be, it'll be a material. I'm uh, against any kind of nationalism in sense that uh, the one or another nation who could must be kind of uh, su superior or others you see we can see that that uh, national feelings of the people anywhere could be expressed through those uh, means that they have in their disposal you see and that shouldn't be directed against any one against any uh, body uh, against uh, any policy, if you wish. Some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Uh, it's completely unclear to me why they're going uh, searching physically tent by tent. Um, and not doing the same things to, say, any of the condos that are nearby. CBC News has obtained thermal imaging footage from a Vancouver police drone at Oppenheimer Park last December. The image was recorded during the police response to a shooting at the park. It shows officers searching tents as they cleared the park and is raising the issue of privacy rights for homeless people. We feel that the report is very shallow. Uh, some of the terminology used in the report is not accurate or precise. The family of a man shot and killed by RCMP officers is disappointed. No charges are being recommended against the Mounties involved. They believe the incident could have been resolved without the use of deadly force. Well-known advocate for the homeless, Barry Schantz, was fatally shot after police were called to his home in the Lytton area. And Dr. Bonnie Henry is reporting 167 new cases of COVID-19 in BC today and one new death. That brings our province's death toll to 254. There are 1,688 active COVID cases tonight. 69 people are in hospital, 18 of those patients in intensive care. But a call for help today on Parliament Hill from a group that knows all too well the brutal economic toll of COVID-19. 200 pilots, flight attendants, and other airline workers demanded targeted aid for their battered sector. Ashley Burke talked to them and heard what the government had to say. A show of force on the ground from those who usually work up in the air. I never have been this scared in my life. Well, I had to find a second job and a third job. So uh, that's really, really hard just to uh, make ends meet. COVID-19 has crushed their industry. And the bad news keeps coming. More root cuts and layoffs with no end in sight. 
There were angers pointed at one politician, Canada's Transport Minister Mark Garneau. It's like a train wreck going towards the wall and we haven't heard anything from him. We want to know what the plan is. What are you doing? Where are you? We've been writing to you. It's been demoralizing when you think that every time something is going to be done, they're going to be coming out giving us some positive news. It's always we're waiting, we're waiting. But both Justin Trudeau and his deputy say there has been significant help. And the wage subsidy actually delivered over a billion dollars in support to Canada's major airlines. It's definitely an issue that we are looking at closely and working on. These workers want an aid package specific to the airline industry. We want uh, very uh, low cost, long-term long loans because many of our companies are about to go bankrupt. The airports are about to go bankrupt, imagine. They're also calling on Canada to ease travel restrictions using rapid testing. Put measures in place, COVID testing in the airports, make the travel safer, not force 14-day quarantines. Nobody can go on vacation for seven days and then come back home and sit down for 14 days in their house. Save Canadian aviation! Aviation saving! Until then, they're making sure they're heard. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. The UK is announcing plans to carry out controversial human trials for a COVID-19 vaccine. It will involve deliberately infecting volunteers with the virus, then testing potential vaccines with the goal of speeding up development. But as Cindy Palm reports, the unconventional process is raising serious ethical questions. Up to 90 young and healthy people will be deliberately infected with the coronavirus. The aim is to figure out the minimum dosage required in order to cause COVID-19. I spoke with Professor Peter Openshaw, who was the co-investigator of the study out of Imperial College London, and he addressed the ethical concerns some may have. The likelihood of discovering something that will be of enormous benefit to humanity is so great that the ethical um, um, the ethical benefit of doing the study outweighs the, um, the appreciable harm that can be caused by the, by the studies. In the second phase that will begin in the spring, the hope is to enlist other volunteers who will be given one of the many vaccines under development. Then they will be exposed to the minimum dosage of the virus discovered in the first phase that causes COVID. Because normally the process of developing a vaccine requires waiting for people to be exposed to it naturally. The World Health Organization stressed that this will have to be reviewed by an ethics committee. It will also need to be approved by medical regulators. This is a plan being worked on by Imperial College, the UK government, as well as a private company called HVivo. The hope is to start human trials in January. Cindy Palm, CBC News, London. France, Italy, Spain and the UK all got hit hard by COVID-19 in Europe. Then they seem to get a handle on it. Now, though, much like Canada, cases are climbing again. But as Margaret Evans tells us, the resistance to tighten local restrictions is strong. Is the United Kingdom coming undone? It felt a bit like it today in a showdown between the British government and Greater Manchester. The mayor, Andy Burnham, accusing Westminster of forcing the city's boroughs into a stricter lockdown against their will and without enough help to get people through it. I don't believe we can proceed as a country on this basis through the pandemic by grinding communities down through punishing financial negotiations. Mancunians have been in limbo for days now as the two sides tried to agree on a price tag for lost livelihoods. I can understand where Andy Burnham's coming from because of all the local businesses around here which are suffering at the moment. We sort of knew it was coming, so it was, could be bad news for the business and the struggle, but it's good news to finally get some information, to finally know. But in the end, there was no deal, and it's exacerbated the north-south divide, critics accusing the British Prime Minister of failing in his election promise to level up the north. Tonight, Boris Johnson said the rise of COVID cases in the North left him no alternative and that there could be no special deals. What we couldn't do, uh, I hope people understand, was do a deal with Greater Manchester that really would have been uh, out of kilter with the, uh, the agreements we'd already reached with, with Merseyside and, and with Lancashire. 
This was a bitter fight, and with such different messaging from national, regional, and local authorities, getting people to follow the rules, if they can figure them out, might be difficult. Yesterday, Wales went its own way, imposing its own full-on lockdown for the next two weeks. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. After a four-year, 332-million kilometer journey, the visit lasted just a few seconds. Coming up, why a NASA spacecraft traveled to an asteroid and the Canadian technology that helped make it possible. 639, live look at downtown Vancouver tonight. Joanna's going to have more on the asteroid journey next, along with her forecast, which includes showers. We'll be right back. The Market Report is brought to you by Fortis BC. We've got even bigger rebates. Rebate. Whoa. On select high-efficiency equipment for business, but only for a limited time.
Floods and mudslides have killed more than 100 people in central Vietnam this month and displaced hundreds more. And now authorities are bracing once again for yet another round of heavy rains. Rescue teams are doing what they can ahead of the arrival of a tropical storm on the weekend. Hundreds of homeowners have taken refuge in the rafters and rooftops of their homes. It's feared a new deluge will compound what has already been the worst flooding in that region in years. Roads are blocked, power has been cut off, and more than 17,000 acres of crops have been damaged or destroyed, and 700,000 farm animals have died. Not a good situation there. Johanna Wagstaff joining us now, and you're also tracking some uh, severe weather in another area, the Atlantic. What's going on there? That's right, Micah. Yesterday evening, the 26th name storm in the Atlantic hurricane season formed Tropical Storm Epsilon. I want to show you the track map for this. Uh, this is now tied for the most number of name storms ever in Atlantic season, tied with 2005. It is expected to strengthen to a hurricane before brushing Bermuda on Thursday, and a tropical storm uh, watch is in place for Bermuda. Here it is on the satellite right now. You can see already a closed eye beginning to form as it strengthens over very warm waters. This has just been a, a record-setting season all around. Uh, in 2005, when Epsilon formed, it was five weeks later in the season. This is the earliest we have ever seen a storm, and we are not done yet. The season runs to November 30th, so I will keep you posted on Atlantic waters, but taking you all the way back to the Pacific, where we are watching a system sitting just off our coast. Uh, it's been a tough one to uh, track in the uh, models. The showers right now staying offshore. So, uh, in fact, if it stays dark and clear over the next couple of hours, which it should, I would uh, take a look outside for a peak of a meteor shower over the next couple of days. Something else beautiful I wanted to show you in the sky, just seeing this uh, from Prince George. These are called Mother of Pearl Clouds, and this is on my bucket list of uh, weather phenomenon that I've always wanted to see. They only happen in higher latitudes. Uh, and high up in the atmosphere when we get ice crystals and the angle of the sun uh, lights them up from below. And uh, I just I just love these. They're so gorgeous. In fact, um, there, there are some rumors that Munch's uh, screen painting was actually inspired by iridescent or uh, mother of pearl clouds. So I will just have to look at pictures and keep it on my bucket list. Uh, but so amazing to see those up in Prince George today. Okay, watching our forecast and watching uh, the showers to return tomorrow night. But I do think we have a nice looking uh, Wednesday in the forecast. Uh, showers might return Wednesday evening into Thursday morning. You can see that just showing up in the green, but I've got to say, again, there isn't a lot of confidence in our models. Sometimes they all come together in agreement and other times there's a couple of different factors that can change the game. So I'm not only watching for the rain to return Thursday into Friday, and we'll watch to see how long it lingers into the weekend, but also a pretty substantial cool down uh, for parts of the province. For, and for us, that will mean overnight lows approaching the freezing mark. So here's Saturday. You can see that blue now dominating across the country. Uh, that means we lose our sort of teen temperatures at least for a few days. Uh, and we're watching for those overnight lows to dip down to the freezing mark. Here you go. So 12 tomorrow. Uh, I've got the showers in Thursday, but I don't think we'll see them until the evening hours. And again, not a lot of confidence as far as when they'll show up, but a pretty nice Thursday until then. And then we'll start to see those overnight lows drop. So at just a nine for Friday. Uh, pretty sure we're going to see the rain for most of the Friday. And then one model has it pushing through to the start of Saturday. Another one has it clearing out and all sun for Saturday. I don't often put question marks in my forecast, but when I do, they line up for the weekend forecast. <laughs> so I'll keep you posted on that one. Sun definitely back for Sunday, and I think we've got it uh, for Monday as well. And we come out of that cold snap in through uh, early next week. So lots to watch for in the forecast and lots to watch for uh, earlier today, Mike. I love this story. After a four-year and 332 million kilometer journey, the visit lasted only seconds, but that was the plan for NASA's spacecraft visit to an asteroid. Yeah, talk about a long-haul trip. And as Aaron Saltzman reports tonight, Canadian technology helped make it possible. There it is, Bennu, a diamond-shaped chunk of rock and dust and who knows what else. Well, soon we could actually have a pretty good idea. We're actually going to collect a sample and bring it back down to Earth for further examination by scientists. Three. Two, one. If only it were that simple. And liftoff of Osiris Rex. 
NASA's OSIRIS-REx left Earth four years ago. Its first trick, traveling more than 330 million kilometers to catch up with an incredibly dark asteroid barely 500 meters in diameter. Then matching Bennu's orbit and rotation as it hurtles around the sun at 100,000 kilometers per hour. Get it right and they could literally pick up clues to understanding the formation of our solar system. If you're able to collect a sample from an asteroid, Ultimately, what you've done is gone back in time by four and a half billion years to understand what the raw ingredients of the solar system are. In order to collect a sample, they needed a flat spot at least 50 meters across, covered in fine-grained material, or sand, basically. Instead, we saw these mountains, we saw boulders, we saw rocks. And that is where Canada comes in. The Canadian-built and designed OSIRIS-REx laser altimeter took about three billion measurements, creating a hyper-accurate 3D model of Bennu. As Canadians, we should be really, be really proud of our contribution here because this Canadian technology has really done something that, that has never been done before. Armed with the most detailed map in the history of space exploration, OSIRIS-REx could ease slowly down to a small spot on the surface, extend its sample collector, and vacuum up a few grams of Bennu. So we've got one more firing of thrusters. Tonight, the moment of truth. Touchdown declared. Sampling is in progress. All right. All right. It could be a week before they can tell if they have a viable sample, but for space exploration, it's already a win. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. Uh, it's remarkable, really. I mean, and it was only there for a, a very brief time. Yeah, I know. I love that we were just going about our day, and meanwhile, you know, <laughs> NASA was scooping up raw ingredients from our formation of our solar system uh, far, far away. I actually saw a meme earlier today, and it was, this is actually what Osiris looks like right now, and it was oh. Cookie Monster eating all the cookies, <laughs> which I think was basically what was happening. Yeah, kind of <laughs> really quick uh, work there by the cookie monster and the uh, laser altimeter as well. Very good. Okay, Joe, thanks very much. Well, honoring their sacrifice, a volunteer is restoring neglected crosses at the graves of Canadian veterans. We'll have more of her work next. These sisters are having a friendly chipping contest on this day. <laughs> but a couple of weeks ago, they were both out on the course, competing for Montague Intermediate in the girls' nine-hole provincial school championship. They begrudgingly watched all the boys play a full 18 holes. Since I've been playing, I've never really played just nine holes. I've always just went out and played 18 because that's what the course is. So, Why is it not fair and equal for everyone? Either everyone plays nine or everyone plays 18. The sisters say they've raised their concerns with PEI's School Athletic Association last year and again this year. They can't understand why the rules haven't changed. I don't really know. I'd say because they don't, they think that girls can't, can't play 18 because it's too much for them and that they're maybe not necessarily good enough, but that's not the case. Like social studies right now, I'm learning about equality and stuff and it hap it's coming to life like right now and it's definitely frustrating. Girls have been playing just nine holes ever since golf was added as a school sport nearly two decades ago. The Athletic Association sports coordinator says he's not sure why that rule was set, but he says until last year it was just never flagged by anyone as a problem. Now that it has been, he says the association is mulling over whether it's time for a change. In an email to CBC, the coordinator said, there is no timeline at this point for when potential changes may be made to golf, but we would not make those decisions without discussions with member schools. It's a discussion the executive director of the PEI Golf Association welcomes. Allison Griffin says there have been great strides to achieve more gender equality in golf and to get more females competing at a high level. She worries the fact girls play half as many holes at the school level sends the wrong message. I, I don't think it's a positive one. I, I think we want to see the girls playing the same amount of holes as the boys. Uh, certainly from the PEIGA's perspective anyway, we, we think that that's important for for equity. The McDonald sisters say they'd like to see two divisions offered, one for those that want to play nine holes, another for the 18. The School Athletic Association says that idea is being considered. Steve Bruce, CBC News, Montague.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Don't miss the Vancouver Asian Film Festival, a celebration of a diversity in film and the Asian diaspora. This year, enjoy the festival in the comfort of your home. Get tickets at VAFF.org. And Chutzpah, Festival of International Jewing Performing Arts, returns this November with an exciting lineup of performances and stimulating conversation. Learn more at chutzpahfestival.com. And for more, check us out at cbc.ca slash bc. Well, Montreal-based rapper Backwash has taken home this year's Polaris Music Prize. Careful where you stand, I'm taller, I'm in the stronger, I lift you up from your feet, don't tell me I didn't want you, tell me don't raise my voice. Her album, God Has Nothing to Do With This, Leave Him Out of It, beat out nine other contenders for the $50,000 prize. Backwash is the stage name of performer Ashanti Mutinta, she is the first black transgender woman to win the Polaris Prize. CBC spoke to her about what it was like when she heard her name called for the award. Uh, I didn't believe it. Because <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, it takes some time for it to sink in. So I didn't like believe it. Even when they announced it, I guess it took some time for it to be like, oh, wow, we actually did it. I'm very motivated now. I'm just gonna continue putting up uh, scary, spooky music and <laughs> I'm gonna go back into the studio ASAP. Well, I was always into like metal and hip hop growing up. And um, when I came to, you know, Canada for school, I kind of stopped. And then I started again um, when I was like 25 years old. And, you know, it was just a, it was just a situation of blending in all of these experiences and influences that I've uh, you know, collected throughout my life. It's almost like, um, you know, opening my storybook and putting it out there for everyone to see. And uh, the presentation, be it dark, is um, what's expected. It's symbolic in, in terms of, um, you know, I was able to be myself and just put music out there like this. And uh, I hope it sheds a spotlight on uh, other people, uh, other black trans people and just black people in general who you know, are trying to do this, uh, in, especially in this climate of um, such disturbance. Well done. And finally tonight, a dedicated volunteer has been working to clean and restore long neglected crosses that mark the graves of Canadian veterans. Sheila Sparks, who became a Canadian citizen six years ago, has done hundreds of the markers at dozens of cemeteries around her home in Woodstock, New Brunswick. She tells us why she decided to do it. What I'm doing is refurbishing crosses on veterans' graves in local cemeteries. I noticed they were looking faded and I decided that I wanted to bring them home and spruce them up a little bit. So I approached a member of the board of directors and asked if anybody would have an issue with me taking the crosses and refurbishing them. Who would mind somebody paying respect to our nation's veterans by painting up the markers on the grave? What better way to say thank you? So I started bringing them home, one row at a time. I use a pressure washer to clean all the dirt and debris off them and let them dry. And then I spray paint them with gloss aluminum spray paint so that they're nice and shiny. And then I hand paint the poppy and the maple leaves and the uh, Royal Canadian Legion um, initials that are on it. And once they're dry, take them back to the cemetery. I had planned to just do the veterans portion. Some of them have been there 50, 60, 70 years. And after I got done with that, I took a break. But in my mind, I knew I wasn't done. In my heart, I could feel I wasn't done. And now, 629 crosses and 32 cemeteries later, we'll see the results. It's truly a gift from the heart because I wasn't born here. I became a Canadian citizen on Canada Day 2014. 
I don't know these people. I'm not related to these people. This is truly a gift from my heart. Which makes it amazing. Well done, uh, Sheila Sparks. And, uh, we're in Woodstock, New Brunswick our, ourselves usually every summer. So the next time we have a chance, we'll have to swing by the, the graveyard there on the old Holton Road. Thanks for watching. Dan's here at 11. See you tomorrow. Thank you.